Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending our webinar, Nine Tips for Better Sleep During COVID-19. My name is Stephanie Moriarty, and I'm one of the directors of sleep at Carica Health. To offer a little background on myself, I've been in the healthcare sector as a healthcare professional for over 15 years. I've worked specifically in the sleep field for over six years. I'm a registered dietitian, so you will see some nutrition woven into this presentation as good sleep and nutrition serve as a foundation for good health. And I have a PhD from the University of Alberta, which means I'm a lover of evidence-based science, because why else would anyone do that to themselves? I'm very excited to have you join me today as I'm sure the changes that COVID-19 has brought to your lives, like mine, has had an impact on your sleep. My goal today is to offer you some good evidence-based strategies to help you have a better tomorrow, resulting from a better night's sleep tonight. So let's get into it. But before that, please note that as you may have guessed, the information within this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And as always, seek the advice of your family doctor if you have any questions regarding a medical condition. There are also some nutrient and exercise recommendations within. These are general recommendations for healthy adults, so may not be applicable to everyone. Also, there are reports that we are experiencing a historic rise in mental health problems, along with disruptions in sleep right now. So please know that you are not alone, and we encourage you to reach out to mental health professionals in your area if you are experiencing these challenges. Now let's get started. How has COVID-19 impacted your sleep? Well, as we know, enduring a pandemic, especially one that has hit this close to home and has caused such disruption in our lives, isn't normal. But what is normal is experiencing anxiety, stress, and disrupted sleep because of it. Whether this has resulted from the fear of the virus itself, a disrupted schedule, for instance, now you may be trying to hold down your job while working from home, or working from home and homeschooling your kids at the same time, which I understand is almost impossible, or even just racking up additional screen time from frequently checking for updates in the news. All of these things can have a negative impact on your sleep. But if it helps to normalize anything in this abnormal time, prior to the pandemic, over one in three adults were suffering from inadequate sleep, meaning less than seven hours a night. So just know, if you are suffering now, you are not alone. And there are some evidence-based strategies that you can implement tonight that should allow you to sleep more soundly. If you do get less than seven hours and are saying to yourself, Stephanie, what are you talking about? I still function fine on less than that. I'm not tired. It may be important to note that there is some evidence that suggests that a sleep deprived human mind can't accurately sense how sleep deprived it is. So don't tune out just yet. There may be still something for you to gain from this presentation. But first I should probably start by telling you a little about sleep. We spend around one third of our lives sleeping. So it makes sense that it has some important functions. During the night, we cycle through two distinct phases, NREM sleep, or non-rapid eye movement sleep, and REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep. Yes, they are named because one stage involves rapidly moving eyeballs and the other one does not. NREM occurs about 75% of the night, while REM only occurs around 25% of the night. We cycle through these two types of sleep throughout the night, with cycles repeating every 90 minutes or so. If you look at the image on the screen, you'll see light blue bars, those signify NREM sleep, and orange bars, those signify the REM sleep. You can see how the pattern repeats itself. Those are the cycles, and that the orange REM bars get bigger towards the end of your sleep time, and the light blue sections, the NREM, get smaller. This shows us that we get most of our REM sleep during the later parts of the night, and most of the NREM in the earlier parts. Cycling through all of these stages during a seven to nine hour period is important to achieve a high quality sleep. For instance, if you only sleep six hours, you can see that you miss out on a lot of REM. NREM and REM sleep have different functions. Deep stages of NREM sleep result in lowered blood pressure, increased blood flow to your muscles, repair and growth of your tissues and muscles, and restoration of your energy for the next day. There is also some recent evidence that suggests NREM is really important in making room within your brain to learn new things. REM sleep is the stage that is most associated with dreaming. This stage of sleep helps us with creative problem solving during the day. It also plays an important role in learning and forming new memories and retaining new information, as this is the time we consolidate and process the information from the day before and store it. 
To access all of these benefits, healthy adults under 65 years of age are recommended seven to nine hours of sleep. Those over 65 are recommended between seven and eight hours. But why is regularly getting less than seven hours a night an issue? Why should you care? It's primarily because insufficient sleep on a regular basis is associated with some serious health consequences, including weight gain and obesity. One reason for this is that sleep has a huge impact on appetite regulation. So if you think back and remember a time when you'd slept poorly and the next day you were hungrier than usual, and like me, may have cleaned out a cookie jar or two, you may have experienced this unfortunate consequence of poor sleep. Diabetes, hypertension, or high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. We know that sleep plays a major role in blood sugar regulation and cardiovascular function, with poor sleep impacting important hormones like insulin that impact blood sugar control and diabetes. Luckily, studies have also found that improved sleep can positively influence your blood sugar control and can reduce the negative effects of type 2 diabetes. Depression. Evidence suggests that insufficient sleep can cause or worsen feelings of depressions in some cases, and that people with insomnia have a tenfold risk of developing depression compared with those who sleep well. Additionally, poor sleep has been tied to an increase in how we react emotionally and become more irritable with situations. Things that may not have created an emotional response after a good night of sleep can create a huge, usually negative, emotional response after a night of insufficient sleep, leading to greater stress. And this is during the best of times. I'm sure you can imagine how this would be amplified with the stresses of COVID and the fact that our typical coping strategies like visiting friends and family or heading out to the gym for some exercise may not be available right now. Not getting enough sleep can impair your immune system. Chronic sleep loss has been shown to make flu vaccines less effective in some cases by reducing your body's ability to respond and may make you more likely to be infected by the common cold which also happens to be a virus. Physical dis distancing is the very best strategy right now for avoiding COVID-19, though it seems like adequate sleep may also turn out to be an important factor, though the research just isn't available right now. Impaired performance. When it comes to performance in your life, your career, or sports, sleep loss has been shown to cause more burnout, poor decision-making, poor memory, an inability to problem-solve effectively, more mistakes, slower response times, and sometimes, depending on the level of sleep deprivation, even more so than someone who has been drinking. On an even more concerning note, Sleep deficiency, whether due to untreated sleep apnea or insufficient sleep duration, is strongly associated with motor vehicle crashes, with estimates that you are between two to three times more likely to have an accident if you are driving drowsy, which can, depending on the level of drowsiness, mimic driving over the legal limit of alcohol. And finally, the ultimate consequence of insufficient sleep, an increased risk of death. Although the consequences of regularly not getting enough sleep are quite severe, please note that right now, during this unprecedented time, it is completely normal to have some nights of poor sleep and that your body will recover. Also, I do want to be clear that there is currently no clear evidence between sleep and COVID-19. It's just too new. However, it does appear that the folks who do worse with COVID-19 infections tend to have comorbidities like hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. So it's not a bad idea to do everything we can to avoid those conditions, and luckily there are some simple steps, nine of which we'll cover today, that can help you reap the amazing benefits of adequate sleep. What are these benefits, you ask? According to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, a sufficient sleep can help make you healthier. We know this as we just learned about the mental and physical health consequences of inadequate sleep. It can help make you smarter, which results from learning things more easily through improved memory, brain function, problem solving, creativity, and decision-making abilities, which can help us in our jobs and our everyday lives. And it can also help make you happier. In many cases, we know that adequate sleep can improve relationships and has a positive effect on mood and a person's overall sense of well-being. So let's get on with it. As we are going through these nine tips for sleeping better during COVID-19, please remember that everyone is different everyone's life situation is different, and these tips aren't one size fits all. The best strategy is to find between one to three tips that will work best for you considering your life situation, create a plan, and give them a try. 
the results of adequate sleep, as we learned, could really be life changing. Tip number one is all about your routine. As most of us can agree, COVID-19 has thrown our daily routines out the window, whether from unemployment or new working from home conditions or childcare schedules. However, it is important to try to maintain a consistent wake up and bedtime routine, even on the weekends. A regular bedtime and wake up time helps to set your body's natural clock, called your circadian rhythm, which is the primary way our bodies regulate sleep. We are creatures of habit, and because of this, our bodies have a tough time adapting to different sleep and wake times. I'm sure many of you can think back to a time when you went to bed late and got up late on the weekend and then had a difficult time getting to sleep on Sunday night and a similar difficulty getting up on Monday morning. Try your best to stick to a consistent sleep schedule. You should notice that it becomes easier to get up in the morning, uh, easier to get your seven to nine hours of scheduled sleep, and you should feel less tired. But what about naps? Now, naps can be beneficial. Research shows that a short nap, 20 to 30 minutes, has a positive effect on alertness without leaving you feeling groggy or interfering with nighttime sleep. But if you're like me and you sometimes lay down and wake up two hours later and then have difficulty sleeping that night, you may want to set an alarm. Not only do these longer naps have the potential to disrupt your evening sleep, but longer naps can leave you with something called sleep inertia which is a fancy way of saying when you wake up, you can feel groggy and disoriented for a good 30 minutes. So be sure to take a short nap if you need it, but not too late in the day. If you have difficulties getting to sleep at night when you do take a nap, you may want to avoid it altogether. And finally, consider a relaxation activity in your daily routine prior to bedtime. Not only do relaxation activities like deep belly breathing, breathe all the way in, down to your belly and out, stretching like yoga or reading a relaxing book, whatever works for you, helps to reduce stress, which is good right now considering all the extra stressors in our lives from COVID. A hot bath once two hours before bedtime can also have some additional sleep benefits. When you're getting ready to sleep, your body temperature decreases, which signals the body that it's time to start getting to sleep. A hot bath can actually mimic this. Though it sounds counterintuitive, the hot bath causes increased blood flow from your core to the outer sites of your body, like your hands and feet. When you get out of the bath, that outer blood flow allows your body to cool more quickly, helping you to get to sleep faster. Tip number two, avoid distractions. Distractions come in all shapes and sizes and have been shown to be huge disruptors of sleep. COVID-19 has added even more complexity to this factor. Removing distractions from your bedroom can help you to get the high quality sleep you need. The first distraction we'll talk about is temperature. You may remember in the previous slide that we talked about how your falling body temperature cues the onset of sleep and can even help you sleep more soundly. Research shows that the opposite is also true. If your room is too warm, it can be more difficult to fall asleep and the sleep you do get is of poor quality and more fragmented. This prevents you from getting all of the great benefits from each of the stages of sleep in their proper amounts. One reason for this is that during REM sleep, your brain takes a little break and lets your body temperature be determined by how warm or cool your bedroom is. According to the National Sleep Foundation, the optimal room temperature for sleep ranges between 15 to 19 degrees for adults and a few degrees higher for kids. Some strategies for ensuring your room is the optimal temperature for sleep may include getting an automated thermostat that drops the room temperature before bedtime, taking cooling measures if your room typically stays warmer, including lighter bedding, a fan, or light sleepwear. A study showed that wearing special clothing to bed that allowed your body temperature to reduce by just one degree helped participants to sleep more soundly. This made me chuckle a little as I think you could get a similar effect if you removed a few pieces, but you may just want to keep your curtains closed if that's the case but that will also help with the lighting tip we'll talk about in a few slides. The second disruptors are bed partners. How many times have you been woken up by your spouse or your bed partner? Whether from their moving or their snoring, or I'm sure there are many other things on your list, this fragmented sleep can have a negative effect on your overall health. Research has shown that just one night of interrupted sleep can negatively affect your mood and cause you to experience a decline in attention span. 
And during this time of peak anxiousness and stress due to COVID-19, bad arousal in the middle of the night can be made worse by our busy minds preventing us from getting back to sleep. So let's prevent that as much as we can. There are a few options that clients have found helpful. One is having bed partners sleep separately so they can enjoy the benefits of uninterrupted sleep. Some call this a sleep divorce. There is no shame in this as good quality sleep is this important. And some would say that the fringe benefits are that it can actually prevent a real divorce. Other options related to disruptive noises in the room, like snoring, road noise, animals, like honking geese or coyotes, depending on where you live, maybe a white noise machine that can help you drown out some of those noises so they don't wake you. If your disruptor is a bed partner snoring and they occasionally stop breathing and gasp for air in the night, this may be a sign of sleep apnea. Treating this condition through methods such as CPAP can provide immediate relief for the bed partner as the snoring often stops the night successful treatment is initiated. Offering a sleep test to your snoring bed partner could be a lifesaver for them as there are many health risks associated with untreated sleep apnea. It is also a lifesaver for the bed partners and their uninterrupted sleep. I know some of you are saying, well, this doesn't apply to me. I sleep alone with the exception of my beautiful dog, Rufus, or my precious cat, Sprinkle. To you, I say, how often do you try to move in the night and wake up because you can't due to 40 pound Rufus? To the cat lovers, I say, how often do you wake up to beautiful sprinkles pawing you in the face? Pets are disruptors as well and impact the quality of your sleep, which has a negative effect on your health. I know your hearts are breaking right now, thinking of sleeping alone, but consider finding your beloved pet their own fantastic bed to sleep in. This might be the change that has a huge impact on your health and your overall well being. Finally, the last disruptor I'll discuss are devices. Why, you ask? Well, there are a few reasons. What do you find on your devices when you're lying in bed at night? Many people find the news. And what's on every news outlet right now? COVID-19. There are some new estimates that suggest that rates of anxiety are four times higher right now. I know staying informed is important, but consider having a news blackout at least an hour before bed to help your mind relax so you don't get wound up worrying. The next reason devices are a sleep distraction is due to the blue light they emit. Even small amounts of blue light make it difficult for your brain to release melatonin, which is a hormone that helps control your sleep-wake cycle. We'll get more into the impact of light in the next slide, as there's a little more to it. The final reason I'm picking on devices is due to the time it takes away from your sleep. The next time you snuggle into bed with your device, pay attention to how much time you spend on it. Mobile phone use before bed has been shown to be a predictor of less sleep and more fatigue. When you're grappling with banishing your device from your bedroom to get a few more precious minutes of sleep, remember the benefits associated with that 20 minute nap we discussed earlier. And think about your REM sleep, the kind that's associated with memory formation and creative problem solving. Because most of your REM sleep happens in the later parts of your sleep, even just getting the few extra minutes of Sade that would have been taken away by your device can make a big difference in your sleep quality, sleep duration, and the benefits you'll get. Tip number three, get optimal light exposure. The biggest factor that drives our circadian rhythm or internal sleep-wake so sleep clock is light and also the absence of light. Light and darkness are powerful cues that tell our bodies it's time to rest or it's time to get ready for a productive day. After hearing this, I'm sure it's no surprise that light in the bedroom has an impact on your quality of sleep. Light at night is part of the reason a lot of people don't get enough sleep. Exposure to room light or sunlight before bedtime suppresses melatonin, which we said helps induce sleep, making it more difficult to fall asleep. Additionally, early sun rays peeking in through your windows, though beautiful, begin to activate the body and can cause some of us to rise before we're ready. I also want to touch on blue light quickly. Not all light is created equal. Different colors do different things. The blue wavelengths, like those found in LED lights, compact fluorescent bulbs, those squiggly ones, and electronics with screens can be beneficial during the daylight hours because they have the ability to boost attention, reaction times, and mood. However, they are very disruptive at night as they have been shown to severely suppress melatonin and shift your circadian rhythm more than any other lights. To get optimal light exposure, there are three things I'd encourage you to do. 
Number one, take a break from blue light or bright screen devices at least an hour or more before bed. If it will take you some time to make this change, start by downloading an app that filters the blue wavelengths at night or activate night mode on your phone if it has that function. This will help your melatonin levels. Number two, survey your room for disruptive light sources. Look for bright bedroom lights and replace them with warm, dim lighting. If you need a night light in the bathroom so you don't have to turn on the lights, be sure to choose a dim red one or one with a warmer tone. These have the least power to disrupt your sleep. Look for street or house lights you can see from your windows or electronic lights like bright clocks, power buttons on TVs, or other things you may have plugged in. And consider blocking these with the goal of making the room completely dark. This will help keep your body in sleep mode until you're ready to get up. To do this, you may have to move some electronics, get some blackout blinds, or even invest in a face mask, though I often find mine on the top of my head in the morning. It can also help to ensure the lights in your other rooms, like your living room, uh, can also be dimmed in the evening. And number three, engage in the exact opposite behavior when you get up and are ready to start your day. Expose your body to the sun to help alert your brain and reset your internal clock. This should also help you sleep later on. Pull open those blackout curtains or find a dawn stimulating alarm clock or a light intended for seasonal affective disorder if you have to get up before the sun rises or it's winter and it feels like it's always dark. Tip number four, limit caffeine. Please don't tune out now if you're a coffee lover. I, like many others, love a good coffee. I'm not going to ask you to stop drinking coffee. That is just crazy dark. But it is important to consider that caffeine is the most widely used stimulant in the world and caffeine use, if it's high enough, can mimic symptoms of anxiety, which isn't particularly helpful right now in our new COVID world. There is a recommended limit for caffeine intake. For healthy adults, Health Canada recommends limiting our intake to 400 milligrams. What does that mean exactly? Well, a latte has about 150 to 200 milligrams in a medium. A cup of your brewed coffee at home has about 130 milligrams, so about three cups would fit into this limit. But if you're thinking back and say, well, I only had those two delicious grande blonde roasts and I had a heck of a time getting to sleep, hidden caffeine may be your culprit. A grande blonde roast has around 360 milligrams of caffeine, so two would put you well over the daily limit. As I said, I'm definitely not saying don't drink coffee or caffeinated beverages, but what I am asking you to consider are two things. Number one, stick within the limit for caffeine intake, taking into account all caffeinated products you consume, including colas and chocolate, which each have about 30 milligrams per serving. And number two, consider your timing. The half-life of caffeine, meaning the time it takes your body to break down just half of it, is around five hours. It does depend a lot on your individual factors though, and can range from one and a half to nine and a half hours. But remember, that's just half. So if you're having a coffee at supper, let's say at 6 p.m., that means half of that caffeine is still working its way around your system at 11 p.m. A study showed that having the amount of caffeine found within a typical latte three hours before bedtime can have you laying awake, unable to sleep for an additional 40 minutes. If you're having trouble sleeping, do your best to avoid caffeine in the evening and the afternoon and see what effect that has on your sleep. Some people find it helpful if they simply stop drinking caffeinated beverages at noon. Just some additional things to keep in mind. Decaf may be one of those hidden caffeine sources. It isn't 100% free of caffeine and usually contains around 10 to 25% of that found within full caffeine coffee. So if you're a late night decaf lover and find it difficult to sleep, this may be your culprit. Also, just to touch on nicotine quickly, nicotine is also a stimulant and has a similar impact. So if you smoke, this may be a good reason to consider quitting. Tip number five, limit alcohol. Well, now that I've ruined coffee for some of you, let me ruin alcohol for you like I've ruined it for myself. Uh, but just a reminder, you sail your own ship and will know what tips will work best with your lifestyle. If you choose to continue business as usual, even after hearing about the impact of alcohol on your sleep, at least you'll have a good idea of why you may be feeling the way you do the next day. Like coffee, I, like many others, do enjoy a glass of wine. 
The Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction has Canadian low risk alcohol drinking guidelines. You can see those on your screen. And sticking to those levels is intended to help you reduce the short and long term health risks associated with alcohol consumption. What has happened with alcohol consumption during COVID, you ask? Well, those who drink can probably guess it's increased. Recent polls suggest that intake has increased between 10 to 25 percent, depending on your age group. The main reasons for this increase include lack of a regular schedule by 51 percent of people, boredom by 49 percent of people, and increased stress by 44 percent. If you're concerned about your alcohol intake, the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction has some great resources, as will your family doctor, so please reach out to them if you are concerned. But how does alcohol impact sleep? Well, on one hand, alcohol is the most widely used sleep aid, with some sources suggesting 20% of people have used alcohol to fall asleep, and probably more now due to the stresses of COVID. However, on the other hand, alcohol doesn't actually help you get a good night's sleep. In fact, it is the opposite. Alcohol is a sedative, and while it may help you fall asleep, it has a hugely negative impact on the quality of your sleep. Drinking before bed blocks REM sleep, which we learned earlier to be important, and it turns on activity in the brain that usually isn't on when you're sleeping. It's thought that these things can inhibit restorative sleep. Alcohol can also make you more prone to snoring and sleep apnea because it reduces the tone of the muscles in the back of your throat. Next, this may be common knowledge, but alcohol makes you get up to go to the bathroom a lot. And this is because it's a diuretic. And finally, drinking can also interrupt your circadian rhythm and cause you to wake up in the middle of the night. Pay attention to that. It's definitely one of the things I've noticed in my own sleep if I've had some wine close to bedtime which isn't a stretch because bedtime with kids is now 9 p.m. Waking in the middle of the night may be particularly troubling for some as the increased stress and thoughts related to COVID-19 can cause your mind to race and keep you awake. But if we can prevent you from waking up in the middle of the night, hopefully we can avoid some of this. We all metabolize alcohol at different rates. Not drinking at all has the best impact on the quality of your sleep. I know it's not realistic for everyone's lifestyle, so at the very least, avoid drinking alcohol too close to bedtime so your body has some time to break it down. Also, consider drinking strategically. Maybe you only drink on a Saturday or at the occasional Wing Wednesday, allowing your body to enjoy restful sleep the other days of the week. Now, I don't want to belabor the point, but I thought if we had time, I'd tell you a little about some interesting studies that are coming out related to the impact of alcohol and sleep on learning and memory, which we know REM sleep plays a large role in. One study showed that not drinking for a week after learning something new led to remembering about 90% of the information, but drinking during the week to varying degrees reduced the information remembered by 40 to 50%. So if you're struggling to learn something new, this could be the culprit. Tip number six, eat healthy meals. I'm a dietitian by trade, so I bet you were waiting for this plate to show up at some point in this presentation. This is Canada's brand new food guide. No more rainbow, we are on to plates. I just think it sums up healthy eating so well, choosing half a plate of veggies and or fruit, my favorite being the magnificent bag salad, a quarter plate of lean protein and the other quarter high fiber grains on a plate that's not enormous with a water on the side. As simple as it seems, this sets you up for so much success from a health perspective. But enough about nutrition. How does this apply to sleeping and COVID? Well, there are three things to consider. We know healthy eating is important in avoiding and managing conditions like high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes. The conditions that we said earlier may put you at increased risk of severe COVID infections. Number two, we know that there is an increase in mental health challenges due to the uncertainty of the COVID situation. Though the research is still limited in the area of mental health and nutrition, eating regularly, meaning a healthy meal every four to six hours, and throwing a healthy snack in there if there's more time in between, can help to keep your body's blood sugars more stable, which may help increase feelings of calmness and assist with coping. There is additional research to suggest that omega-3 fatty acids, like those from fatty fish, like salmon, mackerel, and tuna, may also play a role. So it's a good idea to aim to eat a serving of these types of fish one to two times per week. 
And there's also evidence to suggest that a well-balanced, healthy diet may be associated with a greater sense of well-being, with the opposite being true for diets that contain a lot of highly processed foods, like sugary drinks, fast foods, processed meats, and bakery products, like giant muffins and cakes. This kind of makes sense, considering these types of foods cause poor physical health, so why wouldn't they have a similar impact on mental health? Don't fret though, all foods are okay. It's just important that you watch what you do most of the time. And number three, be sure to avoid eating too close to bedtime. Have you ever eaten a big meal before bed and not had a great night's sleep? You're not alone. Eating close to bedtime has been shown to have negative effects on your sleep quality. Also, if you suffer from reflux or GERD, having a meal or snack that's fatty or fried, has tomato sauce, garlic, or onions, which are common reflux triggers, can make these symptoms worse. Avoid eating two to three hours before bedtime. If you still suffer, it's also recommended that you elevate the head of the bed so the stomach acid stays where it's supposed to, in your stomach. I yield you the same caution for large amounts of fluids before bed. You don't want to be getting up to go to the washroom and then heading back to bed with a racing mind and unable to sleep. However, if you don't feel like you're having too many fluids, but you're still having frequent nighttime awakenings to go to the bathroom, that could also be a sign of sleep apnea, a condition we touched on earlier, but we'll discuss more in a few slides. Tip number seven, exercise regularly. Exercise has an abundance of benefits, many you've probably heard about, like weight management and reducing the risk of chronic diseases we talked about earlier, like heart disease, stroke, hypertension, and diabetes. But many don't know that engaging in physically distanced activity right now can also help to improve sleep, relieve stress, improve mood, reduce tiredness, and increase your mental alertness. The Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines state that we should try to accumulate about 30 minutes a day in bouts as little as 10 minutes at a time if that works better for you. So if COVID has gotten you down and you haven't been active for a while, I encourage you to start with just a 10 minute physically distanced walk to help keep you and others safe to see where that takes you and what that can do for you. Pay attention to the mind boost you will likely feel and the positive impact it may have on your sleep. However, there is one caveat here. It's important to avoid strenuous activity late in the evening, like interval training, or I can speak from experience here, indoor soccer. It's because those types of activities increase your heart rate, they increase your body temperature, and we know that a drop in body temperature signals your body to sleep, and they also stimulate your nervous system. Everyone is different. I'm definitely not telling you to give up those sports, of course, but if your workout regime involves some hardcore training before bed most days of the week, and you're trying to figure out why you can't sleep, this may be one of the reasons. A great job exercising. Tip number eight is all around creating your plan for change. Have you ever been to a great presentation and thought, wow, I'm totally going to do all of those things, and then nothing ever got done? Well, you're not alone. But there are some evidence-based strategies that you can use to help you successfully achieve your plan for change. As I've mentioned a few times, not everyone is the same. So first choose the tips that will work best for you and create a plan around them. Change can be hard and it takes two to three weeks to develop a good habit. So be sure you don't give up on any of your positive changes too early. I would hate for you to miss out on the awesome benefits. If you try to make too many changes at once, it can also be overwhelming. Aim for trying one to three tips to start, break them down into smaller goals, and write them down. You'll be more likely to achieve your goals if you do this. A goal that will set you up for success is a SMART goal, meaning it is specific and looks at the what, how, and where of your goal. It's measurable, outlining exactly what you will do and how you will measure if you are doing it. It's attainable. Is it something you can do considering everything else that's going on in your life right now? It's rewarding. The reward with these goals will be better sleep and timely. When will you start? How often will you do the activity? For instance, a big goal, I'm going to sleep in my bed without distractions. Now let's break that down into smaller SMART goals, which of course will depend on your situation, but they might look like, I will get my beloved Rufus a bed on Tuesday so we can sleep independently from now on or 
I will buy some thick curtains by the end of the week and hang them so I don't see the street light that beams into my window every single night. Or I will leave my phone in a different room before I head to bed starting tonight so I can reduce my screen time and bed to zero. It's also really important to make a plan for the things you think might get in the way of your goal. For instance, when you feel lonely and you're thinking about Rufus before you go to sleep, you'll need a strategy to keep yourself in bed so you don't go get him. It could be motivational self-talk. I am fine without Rufus, I'm sleeping better without Rufus, and Rufus is sleeping better without me. Or you can let a friend or bed partner know your goal and lean on them for support when times get tough. Those two examples, positive self-talk, and getting social support are actually two evidence-based strategies that have been shown to help people achieve their goals. So please feel free to incorporate them into your sleep goal achievement plan. But what if you've tried everything and you're still feeling really tired and fatigued? That brings me to tip number nine, rule out a sleep disorder. If you were still fatigued and tired, it wouldn't be uncommon if the culprit was a sleep disorder. The two most common sleep disorders are insomnia, which is a condition where it is hard to fall asleep, hard to stay asleep, or you wake up too early and you're not able to get back to sleep, and also a sleep disorder called obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, which we talked a little about before. OSA often involves loud snoring with periods of silence caused by relaxation of your throat muscles that can block your upper airway during sleep. This results in a pause in breathing that can lead to reductions in your blood oxygen levels, which is obviously not good because as you know, we need oxygen to live. Because of the low oxygen levels and the stress your body experiences by not breathing, our brains alert our bodies with a brief wake up so we will start to breathe normally again. For those with untreated sleep apnea, this can occur hundreds of times in one night. So you can understand why they may be feeling really tired despite sleeping, and I'm using air quotes here, for seven hours or more. The individual usually doesn't remember these brief awakenings, but the body sure does. Untreated sleep apnea is associated with some pretty serious health consequences, including an elevated daytime blood pressure, increased risk of stroke, heart disease, diabetes, depression, motor vehicle accidents, and potentially the scariest consequence of them all, the angry bed partner. But don't fret, there are some great treatments available. For insomnia, the first line of treatment is typically cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, sometimes called CBTI, and not drugs or sleeping aids actually. CBTI is a really good option for the effective treatment of insomnia and usually involves a structured program that helps you change the behaviors and internal thoughts that are typically behind sleep problems and replace them with habits that promote better sleep. You learned some of these strategies today actually, but not all of them of course. If you think you're suffering from insomnia, talk with your doctor. I'll also show you an online CBTI program and a few slides that may be an option for you. For obstructive sleep apnea, you can see the mask on that lucky man's face right there in the picture. That is a common style of CPAP mask because CPAP is an effective treatment option for sleep apnea. And we see it change the lives of so many people every single day in our clinics, and it's wonderful. CPAPs are actually very common. If you don't use one yourself, you may know someone who does. I should also mention that some people with mild or moderate sleep apnea also find relief with a dental device or oral appliance, which is a special mouth guard that is designed to keep your airway open at night. If you suspect you or your bed partner or someone you know has sleep apnea, it can also run in families. It's important to follow up with your family physician and understand if you or someone you love needs a sleep test. Luckily, there's an easy way to know if you're at risk. There is an evidence-based questionnaire called the Stop Bang, which can help you to screen yourself, or even easier, and I think more fun, you can visit the Carica Health website at caricahealth.com forward slash quiz and take the sleep quiz. It's very informative and also, as I said, a bit of fun, so feel free to check it out. If you live in Western Canada and you require sleep apnea testing or treatment, don't let COVID-19 hold you back. We are able to handle absolutely everything safely and virtually from the comfort of your home or office with our Carica virtual offering. We will mail you our easy to use sleep testing kits and your equipment right to your front door. We also offer treatment and support through our secure video calling platform, Carica Virtual. 
Though some people originally felt uneasy about attending a virtual appointment, we've had a lot of great feedback from clients that they are absolutely loving the convenience of it, and it's working really well for all types of appointments. We have great clients and a great team. If you do not live in Western Canada and you are looking for help, let us know, and we can definitely point you in the right direction. Finally, in the spirit of virtual offerings, RestEd is a CBTI program that is all online and directed by a registered psychologist. The research behind this program showed that 80% of people who use RestEd reported improved sleep. It is a self-guided program, so you complete it at your own pace and from the comfort of your own home. If you suffer from insomnia or poor sleep and you're interested, check out the MyRestEd.com website and enter the Carica 10 promo code at the top of their checkout for 10% off. CBTI programs aren't for everyone, so please look at the screener on their website to ensure it's right for you. If you have any questions at all, as always, check with your family physician. As I mentioned, if you are within Western Canada, we are here to help. Please visit our website or use the contact information on the screen and you may get to talk to one of these nice people in the picture because they all actually work for us. Again, if you're not from Western Canada and need help, please let us know and we'll point you in the right direction. Finally, thank you so much for attending today. If you have any questions at all about any of the stat or evidence pre presented here today, just let me know and I'll help you to find the full source. We'll also send you the presentation, a link to a recording of this webinar, and links to the resources mentioned within. Hopefully you've walked away with a few key takeaways that you can use to improve your sleep during COVID-19. Whether it's creating your sleep schedule, ridding your bedroom of distractions, setting yourself up for optimal light exposure, being careful with caffeine and alcohol, practicing healthy eating and getting adequate exercise, but not too late in the day on both fronts, or being screened for a sleep disorder, I'm hopeful that today has been informative and if everything goes as planned, changes your life for the better. Thanks again. I wish you a great night and an even better tomorrow.